I want to, uh, I want to tell you that we're going to be in our study of Philemon again tonight, but as many of you know, like, you do this long enough, and you know that messages come from different places, and um, sometimes the Lord puts us in a book of the Bible, and we just kind of go through it, and sometimes there's a, something that comes up on the news that's pressing hard on our nation, and maybe that's something we talk about. Sometimes the Lord puts a topic on a preacher's heart, and maybe the church really desperately needs it, that one church, and we preach on that, but tonight, it was a little bit different. I was getting ready for this, this night, and through a series of events, through some music that I was listening to, and some of my time in God's Word, not just reading Philemon, but just reading God's Word, and I was praying, and I started reading this book by A.W. Tozer, and of course rereading through Philemon too. And then something happened this past Wednesday night here in the church, you should be here for those Wednesday nights, but absolutely confirming the message that we have for us tonight. And I want to read you this scripture verse, and I, I hope that it's going to bless you just as much as it's blessed me. And we're going to, we're going to spend some time there tonight digging into this. But I want to read to you John chapter 16, verse 33. So listen up. It's on the screen if you want to see it, but here's what it says. It says, Jesus, Jesus says this, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. How many people can relate to that, right? Absolutely. But take heart. Anytime God's word has the, the word but in it, you should pay attention. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Hallelujah. So Lord, again, just like we prayed a few moments ago, talking about the greatest need of our soul. It's so true, we, we, we admit that to you right now. We need you. We need you to show up here and to speak to us because this verse is so very true. All of us have trials and sorrows and tribulations and challenges that we're going through every day, including this day. And we have come here tonight because we desperately need to hear your voice. So would you fight for this atmosphere, Lord? Would you clear the ear in here so that we could hear your voice? Your word says that our, your sheep, your flock, they would hear your voice and they would follow you, but there's a lot of distraction. So clear the air. Give us ears to hear. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to us, Lord. So speak to us tonight through your written word, through the power of your Holy Spirit, and somehow through this flawed messenger. Our hope and desire, Lord, is that we would hear your voice tonight and all the things would get very, very quiet so we could hear you. You're the giver of good gifts. And so that's the gift we're asking for tonight, all of us here. We're asking for the gift of quiet so we could hear your voice. And if that's the gift that you would ask of God tonight, we just let him know that by saying amen. Awesome. Why don't we have a seat? And you can, you can open up your Bibles to the book of Phil, right? The book of Phil. Philemon, I call him. You can call him whatever you want. We're just going to call him Phil, and we're going to be there a little bit tonight. But, uh, man, I'll tell you what, powerfully confirmed this. I don't know if you guys were, whoever was here on Wednesday, but... I get up here, and, 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 and I'm working on my message, and, and we, get, we gather around right here as we do on Wednesday nights, and we join hands, and we pray together, and Bob Solomon starts praying like powerfully about how we are overcomers. And I'm like, praise the Lord, man. Thank you for that confirmation, God. But uh, listen, I want to talk tonight about this whole idea of overcoming. We've been, we've been going through this, this uh, 
message series in the book of Philemon, and it's titled Get Real, A Real Christian Is. You see it up there on the screen. So we've been, we've been kind of studying the scriptures to see what a real Christian really is, not what your mom told you or what some preacher may have told you in the past. And, 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 and we want to see what God's word says. You know, how should we live? What should we think like? What should we look like? What should we say? What should we do? The Bible's clear of what a real Christian should be, and we have to be outgoing and vocal about that because those that would represent him poorly have big mouths. And we need to have big mouths in a loving way, but we need to have a big mouth. Our life should be loud. We should live out loud. People should see a genuine expression of Jesus so that when you invite them to your church, they'll actually want to come right? So that's what we've been doing. Y'all seem really, really quiet. What's up? You guys drinking NyQuil out there? In the, what's, what's in the coffee tonight? Holy, this is a different kind of quiet, man. We need some energy up in this. I need y'all to help me preach tonight. Anybody want to help me out, please? Holy moly. Listen, a real Christian is an overcomer. Okay, that's what I'm talking about. So let's, let's put up on the, on the board what an overcomer really is. What does the word overcome actually mean? Because we, we don't want to get up here on the stage and start spouting out words in church without explaining it. Uh, here, uh, let, me, let me admit something, too. Your, your flawed pastor made a couple mistakes, right? So I just, look, looking out in the crowd, I remembered a couple of things I was supposed to say, and I didn't. First and foremost, when we get done here tonight, don't just run off. We're going to have a little celebration about Little Maverick. So we got some cake up front. So make sure you stick around and have some cake. It's all low fat. <clears throat> yeah. The other thing I'd like to do is um, I'd like to honor somebody here who's here with us tonight. And... Uh, Pastor John Schneck is here with us tonight, and I just want to honor him because um, there's not too many people that are uh, persevering in their faith in, in our world, and, and pastors are quitting all the time because it's hard to do what we do. But John Schneck, uh, who's over here, would you stand for a second? Would you give it up for John, please? No, give it up like you really mean it, like you're happy that he's here, yeah. Pastors get that kind of applause in their own church. They come here to get something real, yo. <laughs> but I just want to thank him. He has, he has been a pastor in this area for like 30-something years, haven't you? And so I just appreciate uh, the pillar that you are in our community and proclaiming the, the truth of God's word to our community for, the, for a long haul. So thank you so very much for that. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. So anyway, I want, to, I want to talk about what an overcomer is, okay? So we can see the definition up there on the screen. Uh, to overcome is, is to in succeeding in dealing with a problem or difficulty. That doesn't mean that Christians run away, okay? We're not timid. We're not weak. We're not passive. We deal with stuff, okay? We, we meet it head on. And overcoming means to succeed in dealing with a problem or a difficulty, to defeat an opponent, to prevail, to overpower or overwhelm, right? To beat, to conquer, or to crush. Yeah, I see in the picture in your mind. Let, see, when the preacher's up here talking, you're supposed to let your imagination flow a little bit, and you're supposed to be able to see what he's saying. So could, do you see what an overcomer is? He's not someone who's timid and shy and waits. Remember King David? What did he do? He went after that dude, right? He didn't just sit back and wait for the guy to fall. He ran after him with a little rock, and he threw it at his face. He defeats, he conquers, okay? A real Christian is an overcomer. And, and, and how many people have heard in church that Satan is a defeated foe and he's weak? How many heard, have heard that before, right? Have you heard that? Okay, that's not what we're talking about. That's not why you're an overcomer. Yeah, he may be a defeated foe, but he's not weak. The reason why you're an overcomer is not because Satan is defeated or weak. We don't want to sit here and spend our night talking and focused on the loser. You know, the, the, the person who wins the gold medal in the Olympics, they don't go around interviewing the people who failed to beat him to somehow elevate who that winner is, right? No, you, you go and you interview the winner, the one with the gold medal on, and you want to find out why he or she beat the other ones. So we don't want to focus on Satan being weak or defeated. We don't want to focus on the loser. We want to focus on the winner, right? We want to focus on Jesus Christ. And so before I talk about you and I, about us being overcomers, let's talk about Jesus for a bit. 
Let's talk about Jesus first, for he is highly, highly exalted. He is above all things. He's the visible image of the invisible God. He, he existed before anything was created. He's supreme over all creation. So let's talk about him first, okay? Would that be okay with you guys? Let's talk about Jesus. So let's, let's, this is what he said. He said, take heart for I, Jesus said, for I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. So, so what does it mean to, to, to have peace because he has overcome the world? What does that mean? And you got to think about this stuff. That's why in our church we always talk about that you should not just read the Word of God, but you should study what it means and then meditate on it so that you know what it means for you. And so this is what I want to do. Let's think about this for a second. What does it mean to have peace because He has overcome the world? Well, to properly understand that, I think you have to go way, way, way back to Genesis chapter 2. You go back to Genesis chapter 2 and you see creation where God spoke and all this stuff happened. You know, let there be light. Boom, there's light. Let there be mountains. Boom, there's mountains. Let there be water. Boom, there's water. Like he's speaking all this stuff and he makes all the animals and the trees and the rivers and the oceans. And then he makes people. And if you, if you read that short section of scripture, you see that everything is just kind of going good, right? It says that God would walk along with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Just, you just you, Can you feel that? I know it's kind of tough in Florida, but, but we got the air conditioning down so you can at least have an idea of what it would be like to live in Genesis chapter 2. And, and look, when God makes the world, right, he makes it in a way that is good, and he looks at all that he's done, and what does he say? Man, this is good. It's working well, right? There was peace between man and beast. There was no tension. Like, you didn't have to worry about a lion eating you. There was peace between Adam and Eve. There was peace between Adam and Eve and God. They, were, they had conversation with him. He hung out with them in a peaceful way. They weren't afraid of him. They hung out with him just like we would hang out right now. It was a good thing. But then you jump to chapter 3. And doo, they take the bait. And sin cracks the universe. And you know what I love about the Bible? If I was writing a holy book and I wanted y'all to, to follow me, I would write a book where everything is going good, right? That's what I would do. So you'd be like, oh man, I want to be a part of that. That sounds good and peaceful and joyful and happy and successful and all things. Let's be a Christian. But when you read the Bible, God's holy book that tries to bring you to him, from Genesis chapter 3 on, that's all you see is failure, sin and destruction and the sin that cracks the universe it changes how everything operates and there's pain and suffering and relational tension and murder and betrayal and the ground is cursed it gets so bad that God wipes out the whole earth with a flood and kills everybody he's like I can't stand it anymore and kings start killing each other for power and there's adultery and theft and nations are at war just for land and power and greed. And there's disease and slavery, bad thinking, bad practice. God's peaceful plan has been thrashed by sin. And listen, I don't need to teach it. You live it. You know, I don't care if you're a stone-cold atheist, you know something's up with this world. Something's wrong, right? Everybody knows it. It's not a secret. You put on the news, and, and you, could, you, could, you could think that God was Dr. Seuss, and you look at the news and go, holy Jesus, right? Even the, even the non-believers going, Jesus Christ, I can't believe this. Because they all know something's wrong. Everyone knows. God's peaceful plan was ruined. God's word says this twice. Let me tell you something. Two times in Scripture, it says this. There's a way that seems right to man, and the end is it leads to death. That's what God's talking about. He, he, let them, he lets us do stuff, right? And you just look at what we do. The plans we come up with and the things that we do and the way that we think, it's bad. It's bad. And so he's right. There's a way that seems right to man. We do stuff because we think it's the right thing to do. In the end, it's just a disaster. In general, humans think and plan and act 
and reap a poor crop. Would you admit this? I would. And I'll tell you something. The, 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 the world that we live in, it doesn't even realize that it's doing this, but it's acknowledging that constantly. It's acknowledging that, that we do everything wrong. When, when people say this, tell me if you, if you hear this like every day. It is what it is. That's just life. Right? Don't you hear that all the time? That's just the way of the world. That's just the way it goes, right? So, so, so I don't want to bring my, my issue into the church in any way, but there's this, like, there's this thing going on in my neighborhood. I'll just say this. We have an HOA. So we got this HOA, and, and, and so when I moved into that place and built the house 14 years ago, I was presented with a covenant. What does a covenant mean? It's a, it's a real good contract. It's like something that you don't break even if the other one breaks it, right? So I got this covenant that says, this is what you pay, and this is what we'll provide. Lie, 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 lie. So here recently, I, so, so we pay a fee every month to be at this beautiful neighborhood. And so then all of a sudden they decided, hey, we're going to impose a fee on you. For, you have to pay for a key for the pool that you're paying to have. Well, where, whoa, 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 what's up with that? Where, where, where did that come from? Where, what contract is that in, man? Where's that? <laughs> and so I go down there, and you know, I know this is news to you guys, but I have a big mouth. And yeah, I know. And so I went down and I started talking to, the, to this lawyer who's in charge of negotiating this plan. And the wife is sitting in the car next to where me and this guy are talking. And she doesn't say one word until she says this. It is what it is. I was almost not a Christian in that moment. And I wanted to say something too, but I didn't. Listen, I'm telling you, folks, as a people, we have settled for the status quo. It just is what it is. And you won't stand up, and you won't say anything, and we settle for what it is, and we don't care. We will not say a single thing about it. And we just accept it. And no matter what evil and what kind of challenges people put before you, you just, you just say, well, that just is what it is. Because that's just the way of the world. That's the way things work. And because they work this way, I'm subject to that. I'm just going to lay down and I'm going to deal with it. Let me tell you something. Your pastor is not that guy. And I don't want you to be those people, okay? Here's one of the other things that really drive me crazy. This, 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 is, this is something I would like to share with you. Maybe you don't agree with me, and that's okay. We don't have to agree on everything. But one of the ways that I see this, this way of the world, it is what it is, kind of played out is this. You know, countries, they, they, if they have an enemy, if they have an enemy country, um, we'll go and we will kill the, the, the leader of that nation in, a, in, a, in an effort to bring peace to the world. I wish more people in the room would laugh at the stupidity that that is, right? It does not work, okay? We, 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 killed, we killed Saddam Hussein. I, I, I don't know, but I, I looked on the news, and I didn't see anyone in Iraq sending off fireworks on July 4th singing, God bless America. And we, we killed, uh, what's the other guy, the other lunatic, Osama bin Laden, right? Are they celebrating July 4th over there, or they still hate us? Let me ask you a question. How many, how, how many years have, been, have the Jewish people and the, and the Philistines been hating each other and killing each other? Some would say a long time. Yeah. Has it helped when they kill people? No, it doesn't. But you know what? It is what it is. And we just settle for this stuff thinking that somehow it's going to make things better. I don't know about you, but they've been like hating each other since way, way back in the Bible days. And killing each other never, ever is the answer to the problem. It never brings peace. That's just the status quo. Someone messes with us, what do we do? We nuke them. Has it helped? Does it ever? You know why? Because they think they're right, even if we are. 
And we think we're right even if they are. You can't change a heart with a bomb. You can't change a heart with a bullet. You change a heart with the gospel. Someone say amen, please. Here's some more status quo for you. I jotted down seven things. Maybe you can relate to some of this stuff. How long have people turned to worry when their resources are low? Guilty? Like everyone in the room? Status quo, isn't it? That's just, it is what it is. That's what we do, right? How often do people turn to jealousy when someone else has something that they don't? Guilty is charged. It's a status quo. It's just what we do. How often do people work more than, than they should to gather stuff that they don't need or work more than they should because of the worry that they got because of lack? Right? And all the while, what's God saying? No, take care of my stuff. I'll take care of you. But that's our natural default. That's just the way it is. How many people turn to a quick fix like drugs and booze and sex and food trying to chase after the happiness that they long for? Come on. Everybody in the room. It's the status quo. It's the norm of people, Christ followers and non-believers alike. And how many people think that purpose and fulfillment and success are found and they're taught this and you teach others that those things are found in getting a good education? Come on, man. Don't leave me up here. <laughs> Status quo. It's just what people do, right? Did you know that most of the world's population is still thinking that if they could just somehow pull off good enough that they'll get to go to this heaven someday, even though they don't know a standard of what good enough looks like, but they keep trying to get there anyway. Dumb. It's just the status quo. It's just what we do. Am I not preaching good enough? Or are you guys just tired? Come on now. This is not the Revolution Church. I can't, I, look, my preacher man is in here tonight, and I thought you guys would impress him, and you're all dead and quiet up in this house. What's up with that? Would you invite me to Life Church if I could preach? I think your people get more excited about God's Word than here. I think something's up. Come on now. The world divides people, too. That's the status quo. They divide and conquer and, and age and style and color and sex and political position and, and geography, where they live and their religious views and their wealth and their lack thereof. And, and your sin and versus my sin, and we all have some, but my sin is okay, but your sin's not okay. And we divide in, into these groups, right? And can we just admit something here in church tonight, just as, as a step in the right direction? Can you admit the tension between all these groups? See, we can't get better unless we admit that there's a problem. There's tension between groups. There's tension between the greedy people and homosexuals. There's greedy people between black and white. I mean, there's tension between black and white. There's tension between young and old. There's tension between the ones who like hymns and the ones who like this music we listen to. There's tension. There's tension between Republican and Democrat, North and South, young and old, where how much money you have versus how much money you don't have. There's tension between the groups. And time marches on, and cultures change, and people come and go, and technology changes, but no matter how progressive a nation or a people group believe that they are, not much changes, does it? King Solomon said it this way, there's nothing new under the sun. Nothing changes, man. There's a way that seems right to man, in the end it leads to death. Okay, you guys ready? But along comes Jesus right? Along comes Jesus. And he's, listen, he's a revolutionary, right? He, you know what a revolution means? A sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. That's why we have the name Revolution Church, because we don't want to live the way the world lives. We need a change, right? And he starts a revolution. And he's like, listen, I don't think like you do. I don't talk like you do. I, I, don't, I don't do what you do. 
the, the devil tried to, to give me the bait, but I didn't take it. And then he tried to kill me, and the grave tried to hold me, but I overcame that, right? Nothing could hold me. I'm not taking that bait. I overcame all that stuff. I conquered all that stuff while I lived. He never did the stuff that we do. That's what makes him sinless and beautiful, worth following, because he never does the things that we do. All those status quo things that I read to you, he's not worried about anything. He's not, he's not hating his enemies. Y'all do that. He doesn't do any of that. He's not worried about a single thing. Nothing that the fall caused ever affected Jesus, nor will it ever affect who he is, what he thinks, or what he does. The fall does not affect him. Why? He has overcome that. He's above all that. He crushed that. He beat that. He overwhelmed that. He prevailed over that. He's like, I'm above this. Y'all are down here pecking on the ground, and I'm way up here. I don't do the stuff that you do. And we're supposed to be Christ followers, and Christ followers what? They follow Christ. They do as he does. They think as he thinks. They say as he says. They go where he goes. That's what we're supposed to be, but we're pecking on the ground like chickens. Y'all are trying so hard to be happy here in this life that you forget eternity. <laughs> the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. What that means is that he knew that something good was coming in eternity, and he was willing to have it real, be really bad right here, right now. He endured the cross, whipped and beaten and stripped and spit on and killed. He endured. See, we're, we're trying right now to, to, to try to gather stuff around us for happiness now, and we forget about eternity. And Jesus is like, no, 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 that's not what I did, and that's not who you're supposed to be. I endured the cross. I, I put up with bad times now because I'm supposed to be thinking about later. Pilate said, are you a king? And Jesus is like, well, you say that I am, but listen, my, my, my kingdom is not of this place. If, it was of my, if my kingdom was of this place, my people would stand up and fight right now. But it's not. It's an eternal thing. He's like, y you guys are bothering with all this silly Roman Empire stuff. Like, that's nothing compared to what I'm doing. My kingdom is not of this place. I'm not, I'm not trying to, like, take over from Caesar or be some king here on earth. That's nothing compared to what I want to do and who I am. And all of us are so worried about here and now and trying to find happiness right here that we forget the eternal things. And he's like, all these walls that you guys set up, all these labels and divisions, man, I don't know about you guys, but in my kingdom, it's, it's totally different. In my kingdom, there's no Chinaman or Frenchman or Indian. There's no black man, white man, good man, bad man, rich man, poor man, slave man, free man. There's no divisions. Listen, I love the world. All of you, no matter who you are, were made in my image. You have value. You have worth. I invite you all in. But the world system and, it's, and the world's view and the world's perspective and all the things that we're accustomed to that we do all the time, believer or not, it stands in direct opposition to Jesus. He started a revolution to change everything that we do. Everything. So let's transition a little bit, right? So we talked about Jesus and we saw what he did. He said he overcame all this stuff, and that's awesome. Like, I'm so glad, and I hope you're so glad, that he wasn't subject to all those things. Like, he didn't give in to those things. He never took the bait of Satan. Satan himself came to Jesus, looked him right in the face, and said, bow to the ways of the world, and I'll, I'll make you powerful. He's like, please. Right. Bring your A game, dude. You know who you're talking to. So how does this help me, though? It's great that Jesus didn't take the bait, but how about me? How do I get peace, and how do I overcome? Well, the answer is right there in the text that we read. It's two words, in me. In me is how you overcome. 
All of us are trying to self-help, self-help, self-help to try to, listen, do you understand that there's seven, seven billion people trying to beat you? Trying to get what you have? All trying to go after the same stuff? You're in a competition with, listen, I love capitalism, but you know how capitalism works? The better I do, the worse you're doing. <laughs> I could try to beat you. And I'm, listen, I love America. And I think it's the greatest system that we can, but it's a man thing. We don't know any other better way according to, 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 to our rules. That's, the be- that's just the best we can come up with. But the best way a capitalist can win is if I do really, really good, and hopefully if we're selling the same product, you're doing really, really bad, and I'm doing really, really good. It's me against you. It's us against them. That's the way the world works. It's always like that. And Jesus said, listen, if you want to overcome, don't try to help yourself. Tozer said, self is the problem. Self doesn't need to be helped. Self needs to be repudiated and put on the cross and killed. And that's what we need. How do, you get, how do you get to be an overcomer? In me. In me. John 15, 5 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So we try and try and try and try. He's like, listen, you got to get in me. You got to get in my, if you want my ability to overcome, to influence your life so that you can overcome, you have to be in me. If you're in him, you're a new creation. The old has died. Behold the new man, right? you got to be in me. you got to be part of the family, part of the body of Christ, so that my power is given to you so you can overcome. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, here's the thing. Before you can experience the overcoming power of Jesus Christ, one of the things that God has to overcome, when Jesus said, I have overcome the world, One of the things included in that world that he has to overcome is you. You got you got you got to you got to submit to the will of God. You got to willfully bend your knee and put your head down and say, "Lord, you're God. Your will, not mine." We got to put aside our own tastes and our own thoughts and our own plans. Give in to God's will. The only words I could think of was absolute surrender. Will. And to the word of God. That's what in me means. How many people honestly can raise their hand to this? That there's something in your life where if someone was to ask you something, you could say, well, it's just, I'm the kind of person who, fill in the blank. Do you know what I'm talking about? Someone will say something, do something, and the way you think about that thing or respond to that thing is you'd say, well, I'm just the person, I'm just the kind of guy who does this. Anyone ever been guilty of that? Come on, raise your hand if it's really you. Let me ask you a question. Was that kind of guy or that kind of girl, was he or she alive before you got into that tank? Was it the same person? See, if you're a Christ follower, that kind of statement needs to be put to death. You can't say, well, I'm just the kind of guy who does this. I'm the kind of girl who says, if you do this, I'm the kind of girl who... No. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old has died. Behold, the new person. You can't just hold to that pattern of thinking that says, well, that's just the way I am. That's the way God made me. Maybe you were created in his image, but running through your veins is the sin of Adam and Eve. And you act in a way that's rebellious to God. And so you can't just say, well, that's just the kind of person that I am. That person's supposed to die when you're in me. You hear me? That's supposed to die. And we need to let go of those things. See, when the gospel really takes root and hits its mark in the heart, then you cheerfully step down off of the throne of your life. You step back and you let the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, take his rightful place on the throne. And in the process of doing this, you allow his spirit to dwell inside of you and to begin to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. And if Jesus is the Lord of your life, when his spirit speaks to you, you start saying, yes, sir. And you do what it says. And he calls to remembrance when you're in him that you should pray for your enemies instead of hating them. 
And he calls to your remembrance that you don't have to work 80 and 90 hours a week to pay for the stuff that you don't need or to provide for the family that he gave you because he said, no, 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 no. You don't need to work more. What you need to do is work on our relationship more and help others to do the same thing, and I'll take care of your stuff. Come on, somebody clap. We need to get out of old mindsets into new realities, right? We can't just say we're Christ followers and say, yeah, God, I know you said you'd take care of me, but I'll take care of this stuff. That's an affront to God. You're saying, God, you're not enough. You're not enough for me. I need to supplement my income because you're not doing a good enough job. You remember his yoke? That's what I'm talking about. He's like, listen, don't, don't put more stuff on your yoke. That just makes it heavier. No, come and join onto my yoke. Bring your little yoke onto my big yoke, and I'll carry that too, along with the rest of the universe. If I can take care of this universe, don't you think I can take care of you and your wife and kids? I made you. You don't eat unless I say so. Nothing grows without my blessing. You don't have anything that you, haven't, that you have that I haven't given you, so why would you act as if I haven't? So follow me. And when you step down off of your throne... And you stop thinking the way you think with that human thinking, those, the status quo of the world. Maybe, just maybe, the Holy Spirit would say to you, don't take your life. You're valuable. You're a son or a daughter of God. And I made you in my image. And you're a masterpiece. And I love you. And don't be afraid of sickness. And don't be afraid of death. Because in me, even though you die, you will live. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Right? But yet, Christ followers are stockpiling guns and guns up to the roof and bullets next to it. You're going to have to get a nuke bomb to get me. When all the while, you somehow can believe that, but believe that there's a heaven that Jesus is in right now preparing this amazing place for you where there's no more pain and no more tears and no more death and no more sorrow, where everything is good, and you say you believe it, but you're stockpiling machine guns and bullets because they're not going to take me out. Do you even believe in heaven? All of us are here right now, but the main purpose is someday we want to get to glory. Right? We want to go. It's not good here, man. Jesus, you said when you looked around that it's very good, but I'm here to tell you I don't think so. We all want to go to glory someday, but we're, we're fighting it. We're trying to hold on to this life so much that we forget the things that are eternal. But see, the gospel of Jesus Christ changes everything. It's not just the forgiveness of sin through, through the sacrifice of blood. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus, they conquer everything. They change everything, every single thing, the entire way that the world lives. It changes all of that. And that's what I want to pass on to you here tonight. That it's not, when Jesus went to the cross and Jesus said, I have overcome the world, he didn't just say, I overcame sin and, and, and death. No, there's more than that. Way more than that. And I think that we sell the gospel short by thinking that's the main thing and the only thing. And we focus on those things, and that's a good thing, but there's so much more. When Jesus said he overcame the world, he didn't just say, I overcame death. 
he overcame so much more. But so now I just I was thinking about as I'm, I'm going on, I'm writing all this stuff down, and I'm having all these thoughts and everything. And I started thinking, well, what does this have to do with Philemon? Because that's the study that we're in, right? What does this have to do? I told you to open your Bible there. What is it? What is it? How does it pertain to, to Philemon? Well, isn't isn't the gospel? and Jesus overcoming the world and all that I've said to you this far, isn't it challenging Philemon in his thinking about how the, the free view the slave? I mean, isn't our, isn't our normal pattern, we, we all, whether you're a Christ follower or not, we have a perspective on, on the slave. We have a perspective on the criminal. How does, how does the gospel challenge the, the rich and their view and their interaction with the poor? Isn't that what's happening in the book of Philemon? He said, I want you, I want you wealthy pastor guy, I want you to welcome back this slave who stole from you, and I want you to welcome him back just like you'd welcome me back, the Apostle Paul. I want you to change the way that you think. Don't just do what everybody else does. Doesn't it challenge the way we want to seek revenge on the one who stole from us or the one who hurt us? That's what Paul's talking about here in this book. It's not just a cool story. See, others that are in the world, of the world, they look down on, on people like Onesimus, don't they? He's a slave. He's the low end of the, of the socioeconomic uh, totem pole, if you will. And, and he's a thief, and he stole, and he's been in prison, and he has a record. And we look down on people like that. They're of no value. They're of no worth anymore. But Jesus didn't look at them like that. He didn't look at this person like that at all. Jesus is above all that. He overcame that kind of thinking and that kind of perspective. He loves Onesimus, and he sees the value in this man, Onesimus. And, and you know what's really cool? Paul got it, too. Paul understood this. He was a man just like Jesus. He just he understood the value in Onesimus. And when he became his father in the Lord in prison, leading him to Christ, he understood his value. And if you're in me, like the scriptures say, if you're in me and you are surrendered to the Holy Spirit of God and to the Word of God, so too are you above this type of division. And above this kind of looking down and revenge-seeking, labeling, division, divisive mind. It's just, no more is it, well, it's just the way it is. That's just the status quo. And that's wrong thinking. Wrong thinking. See, the gospel would say to Phil, Philemon, and to you and me, that we're all equal offenders before a holy and perfect God. And that we're all equally, in Christ, we are all equally forgiven. We're all equally loved. We are one body and one family with one Lord. And if you're a real Christian, then you are in Him. And therefore, you hear the voice of Jesus calling you higher and calling you to follow Him. And the gospel would tell us, of course, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think, right? First, you, first you, you change the way you think, and then the way you act will soon follow, correct? Yes. We change the way we think. We think about what Jesus thought, what Jesus did. We start thinking that way and agreeing with him that that's the right way and the rest of these ways are wrong. I want to be like you. Do you know who we don't talk about much in this book, Philemon? This one guy that we don't talk about much. And it's actually Onesimus himself. We talk about Paul telling Philemon how to act, and Aphia and Archippus and all the people in the church. Hey, you should act like this, and don't do this, and, and do that. But there's one person we don't talk about much. It's actually Onesimus himself. So... Imagine, if you will, he, he, you, you steal something from your slave owner, and you, get, and you run away, and you get caught, and you get thrown in prison. Things are not going good. And, and all of a sudden, you get thrown in prison next to the Apostle Paul, and, and he leads you to Jesus. So you're, you get led to Christ, and you start thinking, hey, man, this is good news, right? There's, there's, there's good news in this Jesus. Things are going to get better for me. 
My life isn't going to be as in turmoil as it was, once was. Things are good, right? I, don't we want tell people about Jesus and hope that they're going to say yes? And, 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 and it's going to be better because if you yoke up with him, he'll help you with your life, right? So oh, oh, certainly Onesimus is thinking, hey, this is good. Things are, things are going to get better for me. I'm a Christian now. So what did Paul do? Yeah, I want you, I'm going to send you back to your slave owner. I thought things were going to get better. You told me things were going to get better. What's with this guy? Talk about a, a mission field of little desire. You're going to send me back to, to, to my master who, 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 who I stole from? And, and you, do you think that maybe he was a little bit scared? You think he was a little bit worried? You think he was doubting maybe his decision to follow Christ and obey Paul's leading? Normal ways to think, right? So if, if you're a slave and you've stole from your slave owner and you come to me and I lead you to the Lord and I say, okay, now I want you to go back to that same house right now and go serve the Lord next to this guy. How thrilled would you be about that? Not very. Not very. I wouldn't be either. Certainly he's scared. Certainly he's worried. Do me a favor. Open your Bible to Psalm 56. Three verses I want to read to you. Psalm 56, I think it's probably on the screen, yeah. See, if you don't have a Bible in your hand, you should. And, and the verse, it's, the, the, the reference is up there on the screen. We're trying to make it a little bit easier for you so you can get to it. These are the, for the Bibles that are in the pews and on the tables and stuff like that. Psalm 56, 11. You guys there? Okay, this is what it says. I trust in God, so why should I be afraid? What can mere mortals do to me? Okay, remember that. Go to Psalm 118, verse 6. You there? Yeah. 118.6, the Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? Okay, so let's go to Hebrews chapter 13, all the way into the New Testament. That's the Old Testament, right? Now, let, let's go, for all those people that think that there's, you know, there's the Old Testament, and then there's the New Testament, two different Bibles, and two different gods, kind of. Well, I would say that maybe that's not true. So look here in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, this is the part that matters, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. So we can say with confidence. Why? Because you're awesome? Why can we say it with confidence? Because he won't fail you and he won't abandon you, right? Just like the verses before said. And look what it says. We can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? See, we got to get to a place where we believe that. We don't just read it, and we don't just memorize it, but we actually get to a place where we believe what it says. We have to believe that, that all these three verses say, hey, listen, the Lord is with me. He's my helper. He's going to take care of me. Why would I fear people? What can mere people do to me? And, and Onesimus had to get to that place. The gospel's calling him to believing this and saying, listen, I don't have to fear Philemon. Because the Lord is with me. And I might seem difficult, but I can go forth because I know that God's word says he'll be with me. It has to be lived out. It's not just quoted over so, so that I could try to get an amen out of you. We have to live this thing out and believe what it says. The gospel changes everything. It doesn't just forgive and save. And so and Onesimus had to get to that place. So listen, I understand you're standing me back, but no matter how hard it is, no matter how much worry I might have or doubt or fear, I need to trust in God. And his word says, he's with me. I don't have to fear anybody. What could people do to me? 
You know why? Because let's just say he's a believer and he goes back to Philemon and Philemon doesn't follow the orders of Paul and he kills the guy right on the spot. Does that somehow waive the statement, I should not fear? What happens to the believer who dies? Where do they go? Why are we afraid? But we don't act that out. We say it, we read it, we memorize it, we put it on a t-shirt and a coffee cup, but we don't act accordingly. We're afraid, we're fearful. We don't really truly believe what it says and God is calling you to that. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid of anything. What could a person do to you? When heaven is a... If you truly believe what this book says and you truly believe that there's a place being prepared for you that is beyond anything you could ever imagine, and it's somehow really amazing, why would you fear anything here on this earth? Why would you think about anything other than that? You know, Jesus was, Jesus was he knew that if he went to Jerusalem, that it meant death. He knew that, right? He knew that he was going to die. But did he run away scared? He didn't run away scared. Or did he go to Jerusalem and die? He went to Jerusalem and died. Why? Because he knew that on the third, he's strolling out of that grave. He knew that even though he dies, he too shall live. So he was able to go to Jerusalem and face this thing and willfully die because he knew he would live. And I'm here to tell you, it's the same for every one of you. And you shouldn't fear it at all. If you're in him, he's overcome death in the grave. And if you're in him, even though you die, you will live. You should fear nothing. Amen. You should fear nothing. Okay, let's just, let's just I want to close my Bible. I want you to close your Bible. I want you to close your notebook if you're taking notes. And let's just have just a a little bit of a discussion. I want to look up one verse here. Okay. Let's just talk about this. When he said he overcame, you will have many trials and tribulations and sorrows in in this life. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. I've kind of beat around the bush. I felt like when I was crafting all this and writing stuff down and even talking to you now, I'm I'm kind of beating around the bush. Here's the deal. Jesus said this in John 15, 19. You are no longer part of this world. I chose you to come out of it. That's what Jesus Christ, the one that you said is your Lord and Savior, he said those words. And so here's the deal with overcoming when Jesus said, I overcame the world, then it's, ju- it's not just the forgiveness of sin and heaven forever. Like every single perspective and process and plan and all these things that we're subject to, you know, the, the is what it is stuff, the things that everyone else is willing to lay down and just accept because that's just the way the world works, he overcame all that. He did, he's, he, all that stuff that we do, that we buy into and say that's just the way it is and so we're okay with it because it's just, it is the way it is, the status quo. He's like, no, no, no. I overcame the world. Every single way that the, the carnal human mind thinks when left to its own and it does, he's like, no, Done. Don't think that way, and you're not the people that are subject to those things anymore. I called you out of that. You're not of this world anymore. So the systems of the world that everyone is, 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 is relying on, and they're prone to follow and lay down and accept, he's like, no, not at all. I overcame all those things. I crushed those things. I defeated those things. And, and if you're in him, then the power to face all those things in a different way with a new perspective, it lives inside of you. And you should be able to say no to those. It should never be, well, that's just who I am, and that's just the way of the world, and it is what it is. That's life. No, that doesn't, that doesn't count for a Christ follower anymore. Okay? It's, it's different. A total new way of thinking 
a totally new way of speaking, a new attitude, a new perspective, new priorities. And listen, don't cower away from those things. Stand firmly and confidently on the word of God. Don't say you're a Christ follower and then do what everybody else does. Don't say yes when the answer should be no. Don't say no when the answer should be yes. Don't run scared. Confront the problem and come up over it and crush it with the power of Christ. That's the way Christians are supposed to live. We're like doormats all the time, and that's not the way it is. That doesn't mean you have to stockpile guns and start shooting for the, getting ready for the zombie apocalypse. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the ways of the world. See, the, the, the ways of the world would say stockpile guns because the communists are coming. But no, that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to, when, when, when we have an enemy, we don't nuke them. What does Jesus say to do? Pray for them? Pr bless them? <laughs> Go across the battlefield and say, hey man, I know you want to kill me, but can, you looked a little thirsty. Can I get you a drink? <laughs> See, we laugh. I get it. But didn't Jesus say, pray for our enemies? I'm sure glad God didn't kill the Apostle Paul. I don't know that any of us would be sitting here right now if he did. Did he deserve it? I'm so glad he didn't kill him. I'm so glad he converted him. Has anybody heard from God in all this discussion tonight? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Raise your hand if you've heard from him. Proof of the living God. That's awesome. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, I, I'm so grateful. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you didn't <laughs> let anybody kill the Apostle Paul. <laughs> I'm so grateful, Lord, that the man of God got to live so we could hear this, this amazing truth tonight. Um, Lord, I really don't know how to pray other than to just ask you to help us with this. This is like a, a hard message to receive that we're supposed to somehow just not follow everything that we're taught from a child. Like that's so difficult and everybody around us is screaming this message of it is what it is. That's just life. Lord, would just help us not to have that, 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 that common perspective. We all need work with that, Lord. Lord, you're a... Uh, your reply to Pilate that you were not a king of this world per se, but you were building an, a, an eternal kingdom that rings loudly in my ears today. And I know, Lord, that you have called us out of this world. We're not part of this world. You chose us to be out of it and to not be subject to the rules of this world, the, the, the status quo of this world. We're supposed to be something different. That's what you desire for your people. So, Lord, we want to be part of building an eternal kingdom. You said that we were a gospel-centered culture, creating community, bringing beauty to the world. That's the word you spoke to us. That's who we are. And so, Lord, would you help us to be that type of people that would help bring a beauty to the world that's different than what everybody else is teaching, that common cultural standard of it is what it is. Let us not be satisfied with that anymore. You said in this life we'll have many trials and sorrows, but to take heart, for you have overcome the world. Thank you for that overcoming power that's living in us. So, Lord, we're, we're going to take a moment, and we're going we're gonna to receive an offering here. And before we do, Lord... We just want to get quiet before you and, and give you the space that you would need to speak to us personally.
and talk to us about how we would participate in bringing this kingdom to this place. A kingdom that thinks differently, a group of people that think differently, that act differently, that speak differently, that are different. Not, not just people who believe a Bible and can quote it, but actually live differently. A, a type of people that when you said you overcame the world, that we actually lived that way, not subject and not, not cowering to the standards of the world and what everyone else is thinking and doing, but we're different people. And we want to bring that beauty to the world around us. And so, Lord, we want to give to that. We want to invest eternally right now, like big time. We want to do that. We want to invest in that. We want to see your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. That's what we want, Lord. We want to see it here right now. We want people to come to you in great numbers. The, the, the scriptures say it, and it's so true, that a king's glory is a growing population. We want to see other people to be released from the jail that is common culture and the way that it thinks, and the way that it functions. There's a way that seems right to man, and in the end it leads to death. And we don't want to be subject to that anymore. We want to think like you think. We want to do like you do, and we want other people to have that as well, to be released from that. So help us to invest into that. This is not just some offering to pay the electric bill. This is to invest in people coming to know you as Lord and Savior and changing the way they think and live. We want to bring that beauty to this world, Lord. So we're going to get quiet, and we would ask that you just speak to us personally about how we would give to that. And then these men are going to come through the room, and they're going to bring a basket to you. And whatever the Lord would have you do, we would just ask that you be obedient to that, just that, just that. Don't try to, don't try to give more and, and, and be super, super generous on your own. Just listen to what the Lord would say, and just do what he asks you to do, and let him build his church through you. So, Lord, we're going to listen now. All right, folks, these gentlemen are going to come through the room. And I, again, I would just ask you to do as the Lord would lead. No more, no less. Just do what the Lord encourages you to do. Let him build his church through you. If you, don't, if you haven't heard anything yet from him and you, and you hear something in, in, in the moments to come and they've already passed, there's boxes on the back walls you can give online if you want, whatever you want to do. Just give according to the way he's led you to give, okay? So, gentlemen, come on.